grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this Sunday for the Feast of the Circumcision of Christ comes from the second chapter of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, verse 21. At the end of eight days, when he was conceived, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Eight days after Jesus was born, he was circumcised in accordance with the Old Testament law. Jesus did this to fulfill the law. For Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. For the sake of our salvation, Jesus fulfilled the law of God. And not just the moral law, don't kill, don't steal, but also the ceremonial law of God, including the kosher laws and the law of circumcision. Jesus lived a life in perfect obedience to the law of God for the sake of our salvation, in order to save us humans who are incapable of keeping God's perfect law, Lord's keeping God's law perfectly. Jesus took on our flesh, dwelt among us, and he fulfilled the law on our behalf. He did what we could not do. But the circumcision of Jesus was more than just the keeping of the ceremonial law. This was done as part of the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 17, God swore a covenant with Abraham that Abraham would be the father of many nations, of multitudes greater than the stars of the sky or the sand of the seashore. In return, God commanded that Abraham and all the generations that followed after him would be circumcised. Males eight days old or older were to be circumcised. And the act of circumcision served as both an act of symbolism and as a sacrament for the Jews. The act itself was symbolic that the Messiah, the promised seed of Genesis 3, would now come from the seed of Abraham. By the act of circumcision, God was marking Abraham's seed as holy and setting it apart as the lineage from which the Messiah would come. Secondly, the act of circumcision was the sacrament of initiation for the Jews. If a Jewish male was not circumcised, he was not considered to be part of the covenant with Abraham. And if a foreigner wished to become a Jew, then they were required to be circumcised. In Genesis 34 verses 13 to 15, the sons of Jacob refused to marry Dinah to Shechem because he was uncircumcised. They only allowed the marriage to take place after the whole town was circumcised. Now, of course, the sons of Jacob had ulterior motives behind their request, but the request for Shechem and his people to be circumcised was more than just a physical request. They were asking Shechem and his people to convert and to pledge themselves to the Lord God of Israel, thus entering into the Abrahamic covenant. By being circumcised, Jesus was entering into this Abrahamic covenant. But Jesus entered this covenant in a different way to all the other baby boys who were circumcised. Because Jesus entered this covenant so that he could fulfill it. Jesus was our representative. He fulfilled the law on our behalf. This included being circumcised in our place. By being circumcised, Jesus connected all those who are united to him to be a part of this Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, whether or not a person is circumcised now, as long as they share in the faith of Abraham, they will now belong to the same Abrahamic covenant. They too shall be counted as children of Abraham. In John 8:56. Jesus said that Abraham longed to see the coming Messiah. He then adds that Abraham saw it and was glad. Now Abraham did not live to see the physical Christ, but in faith he believed in the coming Messiah that he did not see and he was glad. In John 20:29, 20, 
Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Abraham did not see the day of Christ's death and resurrection, yet he still believed. Therefore, Genesis 15:6 says, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. God made a covenant with Abraham. And in faith, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Throughout the Old Testament, Jewish men were then circumcised. By faith they were circumcised and they entered into the Abrahamic covenant, sharing in the same promise as Abraham, being counted as righteous, just as he had been counted righteous. Jeremiah 4, 4 and 9, 25 makes it clear to us that circumcision is only efficacious for the person who has faith. If a person had been circumcised but did not have faith, then they were not considered part of the covenant. Just as Christians are baptized, believing the promises of God, so too the Jews who were circumcised believed the promise that God would send the Messiah, born of the seed of Abraham. Through faith they were circumcised and joined to the covenant of Abraham. By his birth, Jesus fulfilled the promise of circumcision. By his death and his resurrection, Jesus has now established a new covenant in his blood, so that all who have faith in him shall not die but have eternal life. But the new covenant does not abolish the Abrahamic covenant, instead it fulfills it. By dying for our sins and rising again for our justification, Jesus has won redemption for all who have faith in him. In doing so, Jesus fulfilled the promise that God made to Abraham, that he would be the father of many nations. For Jesus was circumcised so that we would be recognized as true, true children of Abraham. Through baptism, we are united to Christ. We are joined to Christ who fulfilled the law on our behalf, including the law of circumcision. Jesus was circumcised in our place thus joining us to the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, even though we might be Gentiles, even though we might be uncircumcised, we are children of Abraham. For as Paul wrote in Romans 4, 16 to 17, all who share in the faith of Abraham have become children of Abraham. And thus Abraham has become the father of many nations, for he is the father of all of us. Jesus was circumcised in our place, uniting us to the Abrahamic covenant and making us sons of Abraham. God promised Abraham that the Messiah would come. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So too, all of us who share in that same faith with Abraham, those who believe in the Messiah who has come, that is now credited to us as righteousness. So then, if Christ was circumcised in our place and fulfilled the law of circumcision for us, how are we to treat circumcision today? Well, according to the formula of Concord's Solid Declaration, Article 10 on Ecclesiastical Practices, Line 12. Now it is manifest that in that place Paul speaks concerning circumcision which at that time had become an adiaphron, and which at other occasions was observed by Paul, however with Christian and spiritual freedom. But when the false apostles urged circumcision by establishing their false doctrine, for establishing their false doctrine, that the works of the law were necessary for righteousness and salvation, and misused it for confirming their error in the minds of men, Paul says that he would not yield even for an hour in order that the truth of the gospel might continue unimpaired. Circumcision is now an adiaphron, neither commanded nor forbidden for the Christian. At the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, some Christians who had come from the Pharisees argued that circumcision was necessary for salvation. But the Apostolic Church declared that circumcision 
is not necessary and that the Gentiles should not be troubled by such demands. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sacrament of initiation. It was necessary for salvation as baptism is for us today. In Genesis 17:14, it says that any male who was uncircumcised in the flesh shall be cut off for his people, for he has broken the covenant. But refusing to be circumcised, but refusing to be circum by refusing to be circumcised, by refusing to be circumcised, Jewish males were breaking the covenant with God. They were disobeying His command and rejecting His promises. The same applies to Christians who refuse to be baptized. They have disobeyed God's command, rejected His promises, and broken His covenant. Hence why Jesus says, One cannot enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again of water and the Spirit. The act of circumcision was a necessity for the Jews, but Jesus fulfilled circumcision by being born of the seed of Abraham, by being circumcised in our place, and dying and rising again for the sins of the world. Therefore, circumcision is no longer a necessity for either Jew or Gentile. On the other hand, those Christians who are ethnically Jewish may, in Christian freedom, seek to be circumcised, so they may not cause offence amongst the ethnic Jews and create a hindrance to conversion. For you see, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, Paul and Silas are joined by St. Timothy. Timothy was the son of a Greek, but born of a Jewish woman, and was thus ethnically Jewish. Timothy had not been circumcised. Therefore, as verse 3 says, Paul took Timothy and had him circumcised because he did not wish to create offence amongst the Jews. Paul and Timothy did this out of love for their neighbour. It was not necessary that Timothy be circumcised, but verse 3 states that the Jews of that area knew he had a Greek father. Therefore, the first question they would ask is, T Timothy, are you circumcised? And if he said no, then they would refuse to listen to him. But if he could answer yes, then this would put the matter to rest and Timothy could preach to them the gospel. By being circumcised, Timothy made sure that the Jews would listen to him and not be turned away. However, however, in Galatians 2.3, Paul mentions how he refused to circumcise St. Titus. For Titus was not an ethnic Jew like Timothy. Titus was a pure-blooded Greek, a Gentile. Therefore, there was no reason for him to be circumcised. He was not a religious Jew and was not bound to the Mosaic law, and he was not an ethnic Jew and culturally expected to be circumcised. Titus was not Jewish, and so the Jewish people whom Titus and Paul sought to convert would not bother to ask Titus if he had been circumcised nor would they be offended if he answered no. They lived in the Roman Empire. They interacted with Romans and Greeks on a daily basis. They met uncircumc Meeting an uncircumcised Greek was not something unusual to them for the Jews to experience. The only people who were offended by Titus not being circumcised were the Judaizers. Jewish Christians who demanded that Christians needed to keep the ceremonial law in order to be saved. These men sought to place a yoke on the Gentile Christians and remove from them their Christian freedom. Therefore, Paul would not budge an inch on the matter and refused to circumcise Titus. Circumcision is an adiaphron. It is not necessary for salvation. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, if you could win, if you are, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, if you could possibly win someone over to the faith by being circumcised, then do it. We should always seek the benefit of our neighbour and seek to win over unbelievers. But if fellow Christians try to place on your shoulders and demand you be circumcised for the sake of your salvation, then you should refrain and not budge an inch so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved. It is not necessary that Christians be circumcised physically. For in baptism we are circumcised spiritually. In Acts 15.9, Peter says 
that there is no difference between the circumcised Jewish Christian and the uncircumcised Gentile Christian. He adds that God has cleansed their hearts by faith. And in Colossians 2 verses 10 to 13, it states that Christians have been circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. We have been circumcision, circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. Instead, through baptism, we were circumcised by the Holy Spirit, and through faith we have received a circumcision of our heart. For in baptism, you are united to Christ. His circumcision is now your circumcision. By faith, our hearts are circumcised, and we are cleansed by the Holy Spirit. By faith, we become children of Abraham, and we share in the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, just as his father, just as his faith was counted to him as righteousness, so too our faith shall be counted to us as righteousness. For as Paul says in Romans 4, 23-25, the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake, but for our sake. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our sins, and raised for our justification. Amen. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We now sing our next hymn, number 22.